Greetings everyone, it's Professor Fiore, and today we are going to look at the Wien Bridge circuit. This is an RC series parallel network with some unique characteristics. Here is an example. We have an AC source. The first part of the bridge is just a pair of resistors, two to one ratio, in this case, I've thrown in a 20K and a 10K, but you know, the actual values are not that important. I just need a 2 to 1 ratio here. And then on the other side, the other part of the H bridge, is a series combination of a resistor and a cap, and then a parallel combination of resistor and cap. Same value for the resistors and caps. These resistors, although I have set them to 10K, just for convenience sake, they don't have to be the same value as this R2 over here. Right, so R3 and R4 have to be the same value, but they don't have to be the same value as R2, or R1 for that matter. Just a matter of what's convenient for you. So we set these two resistors the same size. We set these two caps the same size. And what we do is we look at the difference between these. Right, This is a differential measurement. The difference between this R1, R2 voltage divider and essentially a voltage divider between the series RC and this parallel RC branch. So what do we expect happen, right? What's, what's, what's the overall effect, if you will? What, you know, why is it that this is sort of an interesting circuit? Well, first of all, consider what happens when the capacitive reactance equals the resistance in magnitude. If you were to use the formula, F is equal to one over the quantity two pi RC, with these numbers, Right, with a 10K and a 10 nanofarad, you're going to wind up with a frequency of about 1.59 kilohertz. Right, so that's the critical frequency for this and the critical frequency for this. In other words, this is going to be 10K in magnitude minus J10K, and the same thing will be true over here. So what are those effective impedances? Right, You've got um, a real and an imaginary that are the same size, 10K. So that gives you a 45 degree right triangle meaning the hypotenuse over here is going to be square root of two times larger. In other words, it's going to be 14.14K in magnitude at an angle of negative 45 degrees. Right? That's what we see over here. Now in the parallel combination, of course, parallel makes things smaller while series makes them larger. So when we go through this combination, we find that we get 0.707 of this magnitude. In other words, this total Z at 1.59 kilohertz, the critical frequency, is going to be about 7.07 K ohms at, a, again, minus 45 degrees. So let's consider the voltage dividers. Back here, this is pretty obvious with R1 and R2. It's a 2 to 1 divider. So, you know, if I had a nice round number, like 3 volts coming in over here, right, we would see that um, 2 of those 3 volts are going to drop there and the other volt over here, right? It's a two to one divider, no biggie. I see one volt. And of course this is purely resistive. So the phase angle would be zero degrees. Now over here, you've got 14.14K and a 7.07K. Uh, now it's always gonna work out to that ratio of two to one on the magnitudes, right? So, you know, if I had chosen a 33K and a one nanofarad, 33K, one nanofarad, you know, I wouldn't end up with necessarily, you know, 14.14K and 7.07K, but I would end up with a 2 to 1 ratio. That's always going to happen with this. Now, getting back to that, 14K, basically 7K, that's also a 2 to 1 divider. And because these are both minus 45, when you do the uh, calculation on this, the voltage angle winds up being zero. So at this specific frequency, at this critical frequency, I would expect one third of this generator voltage at an angle of zero here, and I would expect one third of the generator voltage at an angle of zero here. In other words, the differential voltage, what this meter is going to measure, is going to be zero. Now at any other frequency above or below, while this point would remain at one third and zero degrees, this point will shift. It'll go up and down, right? You know, if we go up in frequency, what happens? X sub C gets smaller. So this impedance gets smaller. 
And this one gets smaller, but it's limited by R3 in terms of how small it can get, right? It can't get any smaller than 10K. When we go down in frequency, the opposite happens, right? The caps open up. So this impedance gets really big because C1 dominates. But down here, it can't get any bigger than R4 because it's a parallel combination. So we're going to see this point shift in both amplitude and in phase, all right? So this critical frequency is really kind of interesting because it's the one point where we get the identical magnitude and phase voltage here as we get here. So the meter shows up as a null, right? Uh, an easy way to show this in TINA is to come over here, do an AC analysis for AC transfer characteristic. Now this is going to essentially do a Bode plot for us. So I'm going to use a start frequency of 100 hertz because I'm expecting, again, about 1.59 kilohertz, and an end frequency of 10 kilohertz, so about a decade on either side. And in order to see the, the um, null that I'm talking about with some accuracy, I've increased the number of points here to 1,000 points. So this is going to be a pretty sharp null, as you're going to see. Um, we're going to look at both amplitude and phase and see what happens. Bingo. All right. Let me bring this over here, expand this out so we can see it. All right. So the top here is the gain, the amplitude. So what we find, right, again, this is, remember, this is the differential voltage. This is what the meter is seeing. We find some value out here. And, you know, if we expanded this frequency out high and low, you know, this would continue out toward the extremes. But here's our 1.59 kilohertz, and I'll just verify that. Get my little cursor over here, and you can see there, there we are at 1.59 kilohertz. And I've got a, a notch here at minus 72 dB. Theoretically, if I, if I could get, you know, an infinite number of dots in here, so to speak, um, we would wind up with this thing going to zero. But suffice to say, you know, this thing is, you know, beyond negative 75. So it's, it's a pretty good notch. All right. Fairly narrow. And then when we look at the phase, we can see a phase coming down here, and then right at that same frequency, we can see it shifting back. This is really just sort of a mathematical plotting thing that they do. You can imagine this just picking up over here. But the important thing is we have this null at that point, okay? So what happens if we didn't have exactly these values? In other words, I don't have exactly, let's say, 10 nanofarads and 10 nanofarads. Right, let's say one of these guys is off a little bit. What does our Wien bridge do? And maybe this will give us a clue into you know where this thing can be used. So I'm gonna do the same plot. And look what happens. We still get a dip, but it's really kind of broad. And notice the scale over here has changed, right? This dip isn't even down to minus 25, right? There's minus 20, there's minus 30. So the frequency has shifted. It's not at 1.59K again, which, you know, you would expect because it's a different cap, right? Phase is doing something a little different, you know? Um, not obvious. Like I said, really broad. If we went the other way, you know, let's say this was on the small side, like uh, let's make it kind of extreme over here. I'll make it maybe one nanofarad. And by the way, the same exact thing would happen um, if we kept this guy at 10 and changed C2. The same sort of thing would happen. So we'll come back and do the same plot. And again, we see what's happening. It's just shifted to the other side, but it's a really broad kind of thing. All right. Okay, go back to our original. Compare that to this. Nice, sharp, very deep, right? Negative 75 over there. This thing's sitting at like minus 12, right? Hardly what we would what we would call a notch. So where does this come in useful? Right back when I had the 10. As a matter of fact, let me just go back to that 10. Just so there's no confusion on what I'm looking at here. All right, so. Where is this useful? Well, one possibility 
is we can use the wean bridge as part of an oscillator. We can take this and put it in a feedback loop in an active circuit, you know, a discrete transistor or an op amp, and make a sine wave oscillator out of it. As a matter of fact, uh, there, is, there is a video in the op amp uh, playlist that shows exactly how to do that, how to make a, a wean bridge based sine wave oscillator utilizing this and um, a simple op amp. There's some additions to that circuit to get it to operate correctly. Um, we can change the frequency by, by um, either turning R3 and R4 into a double gang pot, right, a potentiometer, so I can shift that up and down. That'll change critical frequency. If I want to change it by a large amount, we can take C1 and C2, because they're identical, and just make banks of capacitors and use a switch to change pairs, right? So I can go like one nanofarad, 100 nanofarad, and just change those pairs so I can get factors of 10 change in frequency. And then use a you know, resistive here for a con continual sort of change. So that's one possibility, right? That's the basic Wien bridge sine wave oscillator. Uh, you can also use this in filtering because again, there is this nice sort of sharp response. In the good old days, before we had inexpensive, handheld, accurate, uh, capacitive meters, right? You can not go out and, and buy a fairly nice, um, you know, digital handheld uh, LCR meter. You want to check the value of a capacitor, right? You want to get some accuracy on it. Um, before we had those, one way to measure a capacitance was to um, create a bridge like this. And we have precision components, obviously. You would take the thing that you don't know, like, like let's say I'm taking apart a, a, a circuit. I've got this capacitor the uh, label on it is, um, you know, worn out or whatever. I don't know its precise value. So what I can do is throw it in the circuit and then adjust the other capacitor. In this case, that would be C2, right? And see if I can get a null. I can shift my frequency around and then I can just have this meter. In the old days, this would literally be a swinging needle type meter. And we could actually watch this thing null out. And you could, you know, have um, maybe banks of capacitors you know, to do large changes and then small adjustable capacitors to sort of tweak this thing in. Eventually, when you match this capacitor, right, to the other capacitor, so you have one, one is the device under test and the other is you're trying to, you're trying to do the match. Once you get there, this, if this is the cap, that's the adjustable one, right? This is the one I'm trying to read. C2 we would have uh, some kind of um, dial or switches that would be labeled in terms of the actual capacitance, right? A calibrated dial. So as soon as I got this thing to null, I could read off the calibrated dial what the effective capacitance was. And that was a way to measure, right? It's not, granted, not nearly as convenient as modern um, digital meters, but that was, you know, what we did. And you can still make use of that in certain applications, just trying to balance a bridge. The idea of balancing a bridge is a powerful idea. And in the, in the Wien bridge is just one possible application. There are other kinds of bridges. But this is a nice little RC series parallel network. And uh, it has this unique characteristic, right? So if you want a little bit more on Wien bridge, take a look at that op amp circuit and you can see an, a nice application of how that works. And it all comes down to this idea of balancing these two sides of the bridge. Just think of this as sort of like an H and balancing that differential voltage between them. In this case, getting a null, this nice sharp null. And that's your critical frequency. Beautiful. See you next time.